So hello again, everybody, and welcome to today's IAB virtual, I, sorry, IAB Europe's virtual programmatic day. This is our fourth virtual programmatic day, and later on we're going to give you uh, highlights for the fifth to look out for later in the year as well. Um, this is an initiative on behalf of the IAB Europe's programmatic training committee, and has established itself as one of the largest virtual events in the programmatic world, with global leaders and experts dialing in to discuss and debate the hottest topics. Key topics to be discussed at today's event include the development of programmatic audio advertising in Europe, using programmatic to power creative advertising, and IAB Europe's transparency and consent framework 2.0. Please also note we'll be running a few polls in today's session to give the audience the opportunity to engage in discussions. And please also don't forget to tweet anything you hear, you like or hear, and share feedback on the session using the hashtag IAB EU VPD hashtag. Please share photos of you dialed in to the event or photos of where you are connecting from. As with all of these things, just a couple of housekeeping points. All attendees are on mute to ensure the best experience for all of the audience. Questions for our panelists can be submitted via the Q&A box uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will try to answer as many as possible. The session is recorded and will be available to be shared afterwards. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Liam, who will take us through the first session. And just on behalf of the Programmatic Training Committee, thank you to all of the panellists. Uh, thank you to Verizon for giving us the space to use today as well. And I look forward to a really interesting interactive session. See you later. Over to you, Liam. Well, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, which is kicking off uh, today with, I think, a very interesting topic and, and one that's certainly close to my heart. Uh, I start every day listening to uh, music through my Alexa, or I walk to work listening to the latest and greatest podcasts, and when I want to tune out the rest of my team, I put Spotify on um, to kind of get me through the day. And I think it really does feel like audio is going through a bit of a renaissance at the moment, uh, whether that be what's coming into your ears or potentially what's coming out of your mouth triggering something. I'm very excited to have a, a group of very smart people uh, in the room with me here in London and also virtually uh, to talk about the opportunities around audio and voice advertising. So um, I think we'll do a quick round of intros to start before we start talking today. Um, Valerie, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Valerie. I'm uh, running Rubicon Project team for France and Belgium, being based in Paris. Uh, so totally virtually with you. Um, I'm super excited to participate in this panel. And I think that programmatic audio um, is really something that we've been raising incrementally and exploding over the last months and um, for sure being a key topic for, for the near future. Great. David, do you want to go next? Yes, absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm David Goddard, Vice President of Global Programmatic Strategy at BBC. Uh, Global News. Look, very keen to have this discussion with you all because uh, I know audio features in my life heavily, but not necessarily in my work life as heavily as I think it should. So uh, keen to see what the outputs are here and have the debate about when and how is audio going to impact marketing. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Arthur. I'm uh, Head of uh, Client Solutions at Saxis. I'm working on innovation and uh, scalable solutions for our clients in EMEA. Uh, we've been exploring and working on audio for a couple of years in Europe now, so I'm very excited to be on the panel to discuss this. And finally, hello everyone, my name is Hilary. I work at the Trade Desk um, programmatic platform and we're an omni-channel platform, so it's pretty exciting to be able to be in a forum here to talk about one of the emerging channels, which is programmatic. And I'm so excited I forgot to introduce myself as well. So uh, I'm Liam, I'm the Global Director of Innovation at Mediacom. Uh, I work on a team called Blink and we partner uh, tech and startup companies with some of our clients to solve some of their business challenges that they have and also to unlock growth opportunities. And uh, I can tell you voice and audio has come up quite a lot for us in the last six to nine months. Um, we are going to jump straight into some big hairy questions around the space, but before I do, um, there'll be a poll on your screen uh, coming up. So there's a bit of a jumping off point for a discussion later on uh, in this session um, about voice specifically. Um, do you see voice as an advertising opportunity, a consumer utility, or both? 
Um, we'll come back to that later on in the presentation, but if you could all, uh, if you have the time, just answer that question. It'd be really interesting to see what the uh, what the audience thinks about the voice opportunity, because it's certainly one that I think is coming up a lot in conversation, for, I think for everyone in the room here today. Great, okay, so let's jump straight in. And I think we'll start with the, with the big question, audio, voice, why should people be investing in digital audio. Um, Hilary, shall I throw that to you first? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some of the um, some of the rationale that you talked about with regards to everyday life in terms of how you immerse yourself in it, how personal an experience digital audio is, mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a huge opportunity when you're thinking about a brand and being able to to be in front of someone at that time when they're either on their way to work or on their downtown downtime or particularly at other points where they're where they're actually disconnecting from, from other challenges around them. It's a great way to have a really personal experience with, with a user. So I think that, that's one of the key reasons that audio, I think, represents a great opportunity for, for people to buy against it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna piggyback and you actually answer. I think the, even go to back to the basics, why invest in, in radio in, uh, at all? Uh, and the main simple answer is to reach. So if you are, uh, radio advertiser, you have to be conscious of the uh, of the changing in the in the landscape and the habit of uh, changing habit of music consumption. So audiences are shifting towards uh, connected devices, uh, devices and streaming services. So uh, advertisers' budgets need to shift where the audience are. So if you're a, a radio buyer and uh, your goal is to target a specific segment, uh, to reach a specific se segment of audiences, you have to consider digital as a way of doing it more efficiently to, uh, especially especially if your audience is a, is a younger audience that, that using streaming services uh, highly on a daily basis. So uh, from for your marketing strategy, you need to consider digital as a, a potential marketing uh, tool to extend your reach. And, and Valerie, what, what are your opinions on, on the, um, the opportunity around digital audio? Well, I, I think it's a natural extension of uh, any other digital format uh, that we've been trying to trade or, or already trading programmatically for some years now. So it, it offers brands like a global and complete way to reach users, no matter the formats or the device. Um, as it was mentioned before, I think one of the challenges is actually to understand the trend among the users and their move onto any digital and connected devices. And so naturally, um, in terms of how we should make this inventory available for the buyers, then this is where the hat tech had to get into those topics and really gather around uh, creating this new transaction channel for both the seller and the buyers. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an extension, as I mentioned, of what we've seen with the display and video and now audio and what's next, um, we'll see. But um, this is where we are now and where the audience are going. So we have to be there as well. And and David, what, what, what do you uh, see the rationale for investing in audio? From a publisher point of view, you're coming to a publisher <laughs> or a audio provider um, to consume content. And I know when I'm consuming content as a audio consumer, I'm highly engaged and I'm doing something normally in a relaxed frame of mind. You know, it's never a, I'm never in a task focused frame of mind where I've got to do work. So I'm going to listen to this podcast to tell me how to do it. It's usually I'm listening to this podcast to relax. Mm -hmm. So my assumption would be for a marketeer, you're, you're at a point where the consumer is at the most relaxed and probably most pliable in terms of opening for certain messages. As well as that, I'm guessing, you'd definitely be using audio for time targeting because they tend to be consuming um, certain audio around moments of whether it's cooking or, you know, uh, in the living room for downtime. So there are so many different opportunities that could complement the rest of the digital ecosystem. You know, how does audio fit in with, you know, or combine with your marketing strategy when you come to video and digital display? So it's, for me, it's how and when to use that. And I guess that's going to come with vast amounts of data that we're going to have to start ingesting at some point from increased usage around audio and potentially voice devices further down the road to understand user consumption, therefore defining how it fits in with a marketing strategy. 
but that's, I guess, a headache for you guys. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> it should be cool, right. you know. You, you, you provided me with a good jump off point to ask you a direct question now, and I think Damn. as uh, <laughs> my, my day typically starts with, um, with either BBC Radio 6 or a check of the weather uh, on a day like today in London, I'd be checking the weather. But you know, as someone that's sort of in the middle of it with the BBC in terms of creation of content, but also as a media owner, how do you see the developments in voice and audio impacting the wider digital ecosystem? I'll come in from a purely programmatic um, kind of point of view here. Um, obviously, my, as you can tell by my job title, I focus on the programmatic elements of our business. And look, for a publisher such as ourselves at BBC Global News, who doesn't specially solely in you know radio and digital audio output, mm -hmm. it's really not having a significant impact on the overall makeup of digital mm -hmm. ad revenue. So um, we are currently um, monetizing our podcast um, at a, a podcast um, at the moment through digital audio, um, and are exploring other digital audio opportunities and eventually voice. Mm -hmm. But we've seen not significant inroads for us to kind of reevaluate our whole ecosystem to accommodate voice just yet. There's no yeah. data to justify that. Right. However, I don't think we're too far away. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been looking at some of the data around consumption, especially around voice at the BBC, you know, with various um, BBC audio podcasts or audio opportunities around BBC sounds. And um, it's growing significantly, especially with a 5G revolution, you know, imminent that we keep hearing about maybe that'll be the year of mobile and um, we're going to see an, a complete explosion of um, kind of connected home devices that means we're probably going to be engaging with it via an audio control system or device even more and mm -hmm. um, but look since the launch of well voice and BBC sounds over the last 12 months we've seen massive increase so uh, 300 million live radio streams and um, 2 million unique users are already consuming their, their news via flash briefs briefings we don't have that many on voice just yet, so that's going to increase. But the, there's a, a, a data showing that it's becoming habitual. So, like over half of the people consuming our content via a voice device are coming back more than once a week. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, like all of us, if you've got one of those devices in your home, it's becoming habitual. That means that there is an opportunity at some point when these um, advertising, we talk about what's right in this environment, especially around voice coming up, but if ad opportunities around voice opens up, it's going to be the new kind of mm. battleground for marketeers. Yeah. If this is the kind of behaviour we're already seeing from quite a young device. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, Arthur and Valerie mentioned before around reach being something that was key. It's a new channel to reach consumers in, particularly at certain times of the day, like the morning, for example. I saw a chart showed recently like the main point of use is between seven or eight in the morning but Hillary you talked a little bit more about personalization as well obviously a connection with the individual here um, obviously this is a programmatic day so we need to talk a little bit about programmatic but the audio opportunity for radio is very different from the programmatic opportunity um, in the space I mean Arthur uh, working at Zaxis you're obviously privy to a lot of data-led thinking, how do you see the difference uh, when it comes to programmatic audio versus traditional audio and what the opportunity is for brands? Yeah, we see this as a, as a, as a massive opportunity. And I think to touch on that in the previous uh, question just a little bit, um, with audio joining programmatic, enhance the whole landscape overall, uh, being able to reach a user when they're outside the screen, when they are between the screens and use that information to fuel uh, current programmatic activities like social search display uh, it opens a new type of possibilities in terms of targeting and execution it's additional piece of the puzzle of the whole journey uh, of the user that we have uh, right now which audio brings as an additional data source mm -hmm. uh, that previously wasn't available for us like when we talk about programmatic it's mainly display so the search and social so audio with all the data that will bring to the landscape i think the the whole landscape is going to benefit from this uh but touching on programmatic audio specifically uh first of all there's going to be a, the tools that we right now have for programmatic is going to be available like specifically targeting capabilities such as mm -hmm. audience uh location weather targeting then we have reporting capabilities to be able to accurately determine, uh, measure which users we manage to reach in what segment, what location, at which time. 
And then the combination of those targeting capabilities and reporting capabilities that enable us, and, uh, and Hillary, you mentioned in terms of personalization, is to deliver a customized uh, or dynamic audio creative to a user based on those additional data points that we have uh, from all our programmatic activities. Uh, so I think overall, uh, the whole landscape is going to benefit. Mm -hmm. And then the audio execution is going to be more complex, more accurate, and more measurable in terms of uh, the outcomes and benefits that we deliver to the clients. And um, the measurement piece is an interesting one here around like you know what we can what we can um, track in terms of um, consumer behavior change, but also potentially go to sales, which is something that hasn't been able to be achieved um, through above the line audio. Um, Hilary, what what's what are your thoughts on that? I think um, it's a, it's lovely to hear what Arthur was talking about in terms of um, bringing it all together. And I think that the key thing is around that holistic reporting and attribution, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think we're using words that are programmatic, so. So reporting attribution, if you take it back to a marketeer and you talk about one-to-one -one marketing, that's what they want to be able to do. And looking at all of those different channels uh, that you're working within uh, and adding audio to the mix programmatically, you will now be more efficient with your budgets. And you're actually being able to tell a story to someone, regardless of the device they're on and the environment that they're in. And that's exactly what we're trying to do within that programmatic ecosystem, is bringing audio into that frame and to be able to say, as a marketeer, I can now be able to say where my money's going, but most importantly, how it's affecting my outcome and having it within the ecosystem of programmatic gives you that ability to do that holistically um, by the reporting capabilities that you've got, by the targeting capabilities that you've got as well. Right. And I think, you know, to, to me, this sounds like a very, very exciting space and my background's in planning. And as, as an agency guy in the room here, I think I've had a long discussion over many years with my clients about a programmatic being a way of buying and a way of working, not so much a channel which to buy media on and certainly hearing everyone's thoughts in the room you start to hear a story here about audio moving from almost a broadcast channel into one of personalization one of greater transparency potentially one of um i guess repositioning around things like performance and actually tracking through the conversion um but having looked at some of the numbers and the availability of programmatic inventory it's definitely a lot lower than what we might expect um Valerie, what do you see as some of the barriers um, for, for, for growth in programmatic audio? And, and what, what do we see changing in the next few months that might unlock growth in that space? So I, I think that there are barriers, kind of barriers coming from every part of the game here. Um, if, if we look at marketers, I mean, it, it's been it's been mentioned by Harto, but there's really um, a sense of being more creative and reimagine how um, how the, the audio message should be sent and formulate when it reaches you there through digital channel, um, and also. Um, also make make sure that the marketers are aware that the um, audio is now available through programmatic through the pro programmatic buys, um, which which led me to also um, include like the buyer and the organization uh, challenges within agencies and trading desks to really know who owns the programmatic um, audio buys. Uh, this is something that um, we've, we've experienced several times. Like you're reaching into to a buyers and and all of a sudden it it requires them to gather and to decide like who really is gonna activate and uh, and conduct those buys on behalf of of the brands. Like is it is it um, still a, a broad kind of broadcaster budget or does it go into the digital team? Um, so it's mm -hmm. it's still kind of a challenge to get spent from, that spend shifting from tra traditional media budget to digital audio. Um, mm -hmm. Then I, I can touch on the supply. <laughs> um, there, there is, I think, still a limited amount of quality sellers, but um, uh, there's the reassurance, like the one that we have uh, available in the market are the good ones. Uh, it's it's costly to create content, so it, it requires investment, massive investment from a content provider, um, especially um, in, in the podcast and the content space. Um, and also we're seeing that a producer um, specifically for podcasts are kind of reluctant so far to have pre-recorded automated hat being placed in front of their own content. So um, on top of some technical challenges, Challenge. Um, th there's also this uh, this question of being sure that as a content provider, the, the advertising experience for my consumers and my users are um, are a, a, is a good experience, basically. And and the last piece, um, if I may take some extra seconds to answer, is oh, around ad techs. <laughs> um, 
uh, as any emerging channel, there, there are several uh, type of integration and protocols to make sure that those transactions can actually happen in the programmatic space. Um, but um, We've seen that the work the IAB has done um, to standardize audio ad serving through the VAST 4.1 protocol is um, is uh, finally uh, giving us a, a brace and, um, and a future in terms of uh, having a wider industry adoption and then that will help having a, a, a clearer and more transparent marketplace on, on programmatic audio, I think. That's an interesting point and I think a lot of the the points you raise them are also barriers that I know I've, I've uh, encountered when video was moving towards being programmatic. And I'm, I'm going to throw a sort of random question out to the room. Um, I, it's fair to say, I, I feel personally that actually a lot of brands still haven't taken full advantage of the personalization element when it comes to programmatic performance brands do it very well because it makes sense to change price points and things like that. Um, but, you know, it's hard enough trying to get good radio creative, let alone personalized yeah. audio creative. Um, maybe I'll throw it out um, to you, David. You know, you've got obviously got tons of inventory when it comes to audio. How are you working with brands to help them understand the personalization opportunity? And are there certain external partners that you might want to work with to make that happen? A lot of this is under investigation at the moment or, you know, development, because again, it's, we're trying well other areas of our business are trying to work with brands about how do we engage with people in an audio mm -hmm. environment but again you're with the personalization element as well you're increasing the barrier to entry because i'm not an expert when it comes to um creative content when it comes to or creating content when it comes to audio but i'm assuming there's quite a high barrier to creating mm -hmm. it's not like taking a few digital apps, assets put them together and you've got a native ad or a display ad so what elements, how do you personalize those? Do you have to make multiple elements and then are we using dynamic creative optimization in audio to deliver those as mm. well and at what touch points? Then you've got the other issue from our end as well, um, which is quality control. We're talking about all the barriers to entry and bringing more advertising in. For a publisher, obviously there's the concerns, which Valerie kind of alluded to as well, is how do you make sure that the users are getting the best experience? How do we police the ads? in a programmatic world as a publisher to make sure that the right ads are coming in, appearing in front of the right users around the right content even around brand safety say we've got a hard news story on audio will there be similar concerns as we have in digital and how to ensure that the right ads are taken down from that as well so we've got all those other big things we need to figure out in around content um, classifications and putting that in real time and making sure the blocks work and these are all fun things to think about, <laughs> but genuinely, this is what we have in yeah. all other media. Mm. We're going to have it in audio as well. And these yeah. are questions that as a business who takes user you know, experience really importantly, especially in an ad world, um, ad enabled world outside of the UK. Obviously, we don't monetize in the UK, but outside mm. of the UK, we've got to consider the user impact yeah. of these audio ads as well. Mm. So that's just a few challenges, <laughs> but but it, despite that, if we can overcome those hurdles, which we will as an industry, because we've done it time and time again with video, with digital, it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it is very exciting. Arthur, do you, are you, as a sort of more agency person, are you taking any steps to help educate clients around the opportunity or take them on a journey? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the one of the challenges as well to educate about the programmatic and specifically about programmatic audio. Uh, I think we touched about that in terms of if you approach different people in different mm -hmm. uh, in different agencies, uh, they will have a different perception of what programmatic audio is. More digital teams will expect more. As soon as we use programmatic, the expectation is very high what we can achieve and what we can deliver. But for a uh, for a uh, area that is still in development uh, and have so many challenges. Uh, there's a whole process that we need to go through to actually reach those targeting and measurement capabilities that we have for our uh, programmatic activities. Um, then, uh, yeah, so the, the perception is very different. So a lot of this is just educational piece. This is how it works. This is what is uh, available for us in terms of targeting and uh, measurability. Then personalization is another uh, is another top hot topic and uh, development of this. It's it, it's uh, it still needs to be finalized in terms of how it's done. So yeah, those are the challenges on top of the technical yeah. requirements that we need to put together to to make this available. But those are fun to have. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I know that we're, we're, we're going to jump onto voice in a second, but before we do, we've heard measurement brought up a couple of times and the ability to track through the sale, which is very, very exciting for pretty much every brand that I work with. Um, Hillary, how should brands be approaching the uh, the measurement piece when it comes to audio advertising? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of key things for me with that, and touching on some of the points before um, to lead into that. And um, one of the things I like, I like to think about with programmatic is it's this exciting environment where you can we talk about attribution and you can look at one-to-one -one marketing and you can look at all the different channels. And I always think of the phrase, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And, that, and, and that, that's all about going back to the client and education mm -hmm. on which channels work well together, where in the funnel that all works as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a good combination. And I think from a programmatic point of view, from a platform point of view, it's really important for us to be able to educate um, our agencies and our and, and brands as well about the value of actually that connected experience, but where there's real opportunity in certain elements being connected, as opposed to everything being joined up together and finding out your reach is actually just two people. Yeah. So yeah. on that point, in terms of what you can measure, of course, reach, as we talked about at the beginning, what are the benefits of that? Um, you can measure your reach at that, especially mm -hmm. at that awareness stage. Um, completion rates when you've got companion banners, banners that have been served in some environments, again, is an area that you can, you can measure. Um, when I talk about completion rates from an audio point of view, most people say that's 100%, isn't it? But yeah. there's quartiles as well. So, yeah. you, and then you can create audiences off the back of that and listen to 50% of it. That's a new audience that I could potentially retarget and within a different environment. Mm -hmm. Again, but consider your scale. These are the things that, you know, in a different environment from video to display, your scale is going to be much bigger. Mm -hmm. In audio, from audio to digital out of home, you might want to consider that in terms of how many people you're actually going to reach. So um, geo, we talked about again as well, um, data segments, you can target against, you can report out against that. So a lot of the grains are transferable, but it's important to be aware where there's gaps in that transition and being able to focus on those that are relevant. Great. Well, um, you mentioned just because you can doesn't mean you should, and I think that's a good jumping off point to talk about voice. Sorry, I'm not being cynical. <laughs> I, I love voice. Um, how does voice differ from audio? Is a big question. I think these, we've lumped these two together today, but I think they're very, very different opportunities in terms of how consumers use devices and, and different times of the day and passive versus active. But David, again, as as the representative of uh, one of the UK's finest voice skill makers, uh, how do you see voices being different from audio advertising? It's going to be really interesting. Uh, this voice and everything I want to say now is speculative about how we can use it in marketing. And I'm going to come at it from a point of a consumer of voice at home. A couple of years ago, I think I was bought for Christmas, one of those little dots. And now I've entered into this whole connected world addiction. You know, everything mm. I can connect to it, I will try and attempt to. I haven't gone down the road of white goods, but I'm sure that's only coming. So you think about how people are using it, like myself on a day-to-day -day basis and as I said with 5G more and more people I think are going to be entering into this so waking up in the morning with your alarm telling you about what your diary looks like um, listening to the headlines on the news asking about your commute mm -hmm. then you, you you look at other things around the consumption so turning lights on controlling energy devices within your house heating temperatures and then you know talking about which OTT CTV device or something like that you're going to watch on TV by throwing up via whatever device you've got plugged in because they're all connected. And then we can even speculate about white goods, you know, what's in my fridge. Mm. So straight away, you can see how this could penetrate everybody's home life. Mm. Where are the ad opportunities for the marketeer? I mean, we could go gung ho and say, mm. right, when your energy device is kicking off and telling you a temperature, it could tell you to switch to a better energy supplier. You're running low milk in a fridge. Here's an FMCG brand that you should be considering or put something else in your fridge or even content recommendation around this new movie out on this OTT device or go watch this one over here on this OTT device. That would be really interesting mm. because there's so much data and personalization involved. But should we be doing that as yeah, well? Yeah. You know, that that's quite intrusive. Yeah. Will the user allow us to do that? Yeah. And there are so many considerations around how we, first of all, minimize disruption for users, but maximize opportunities for obviously marketing and obviously marketing will fund better content to be produced. So it's finding that balance between mm -hmm. those two things, which makes it a really exciting space and a really interesting battleground. Because yeah. if we have fewer opportunities, um, whether it's from really DR heavy, like switching energy supplier mm. to branded content to talk about what you should be watching at the weekend, there's going to be fewer 
uh, opportunities to have that and it means that we're going to have to be far more creative so again we could speculate about, about what a good effective ad experience could look like but I think I think that should be kind of over to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry Put the about pressure that. on us. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a very interesting conversation. We could go on for a long time. And I think since the last bit of hardware that impacted how we advertise was the mobile phone, and still a lot of people treat it like a very, very small TV screen. Um, and I think that might not be the best way to approach mobile because there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, now, I think this would be a great time to be unleashing our in-depth poll on what people think about where with voice and opportunity or utility. Um, and hopefully that should be put up on screen or no, I can read it out. Okay, so oh, it's not very it's not very conclusive. 28% uh, think it's an advertising opportunity, 12% think it's a utility, and 60% think it's a quote. Um, <laughs> so the million euro question, Valerie, what do you think? Is it a space for advertising or do you see it as a consumer utility? Or both? Well, I, I would say both as uh, as I'm both um, a consumer and an advertising professional, so I can see both sides of the story here. But um, for sure, this is um, this is very speculative, as as it's been said before, as we speak, because paid advertising is not allowed in Google or Amazon smart speakers so far. So. Um, it, it will require us, uh, brands to really invest and build action skills, probably and. Um, and same for for the the sellers like the, the supply content provider that that will have to to work on that smart speaker specific app um, that will require a lot of work uh, but hopefully they will that will happen someday. Um, but again, and it was said before, um, the user that we're trying to reach here is that should be at the center of all our thoughts when it comes to uh, knowing him better. And, and with voice, it's, it's becoming critical to, to really put the user privacy um, at the center of anything we're trying to build or, or, or tr translate into whatever advertising and trading we want to do around that. Um, ensuring the content from the user will be crucial. Um, there are screens with uh, on smart speakers. There will be screens and interface in more and more devices. Um, but because someone um, bought a smart speaker doesn't, doesn't mean that they're consenting to being targeted um, using whatever they would say to that smart speaker. So the, we, we have to think as an industry as a long-term viable option when it comes to user privacy um, for anything that would be related to, to voice um, in the future. Great. I'm conscious of time. We've got a couple more quick questions I want to whip through. Um, obviously, a space that is changing dramatically, being driven by some of the, the big digital tech players uh, out in the valley, but um, David, what is the industry and what is IAB Europe doing about um, digital and programmatic audio? So I'm going to have to put my IAB Europe hat on. I'm part of the IAB <laughs> Europe Programmatic Trading Committee that do some fabulous things. And I'm just going to say that IAB Europe is aiming to provide insight and education um, by the following initiatives around audio. So we're measuring digital audio ad spend in its in our um, ADEX benchmarking study. There'll be lots of, um, I hope, coming forward, especially as this advances blog content with experts uh, from the membership on development of programmatic audio, so you can seek out that for device. You could also listen to this back, am I right, on the website as well, to hear your wonderful insights as well on this stuff. So I'm sure this will be listened back to over and over. Um, and also, the it may already be out, the survey from Zaxus on understanding the status of programmatic audio across Europe as well. So definitely download that, have a good read of that as well, because there'll be some fantastic insights and advice probably you can draw out of that. Great. Now, here's the question I get asked all the time by the clients I work with. What brands are doing voice well, and where do we see the space going? And I sort of whip around the room and then bounce to Valerie. David, do you want to go first? I just... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, there are lots of things, and but I just still can't get Adam Buxton's jingles out of my <laughs> head, and that's for a large number of brands. Like and subscribe. I like and subscribe. Yeah. The Economist, he always does some really interesting stuff yes. there as well. Yeah. And I find that it's one of the most engaging audio ads you see, getting a well-respected individual and a podcaster to deliver your message, and but because it tends to be quite genuine as well, so authentic, let's say. But um, I want to have to pick up Adam Buxton there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great podcast. Uh, yeah. Arthur, what do you think? yeah, I agree. I think uh, audio and podcasting is very effective, and and, and economists uh, come across that ad con constantly. So, so I think I feel like this is a, the, one of the effective ones. Uh, in terms of voice, uh, 
uh, we still have to hit a few milestones in terms of adoption of the uh, of the devices. Um, obviously, it, the voice is a very natural for, a way for us to interact with, with uh, between ourselves. But in terms of that's not the way we interact with devices at the moment. So it's also a cultural shift that needs to happen for for the way we interact with devices before we can actually move to explore how we can use this for a marketing strategy. So I feel like uh, audio will uh, get more adoption, uh, will fix a lot of targeting and uh, measure of build challenges, and uh, voice will uh, will need to hit a few milestones before we can explore further. Great. Hillary? Ooh, tough one. You've nicked all the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's like the, to follow on Arthur's point, and, and I think what's quite important is um, where it needs to be uh, and where it currently is. It, it's uh, an exciting opportunity. But I think that pers we talk about personalization, and, and I think Data is the key. There is lots of challenges around data, and and, and Dave's touched on some key points about the consent side of things. But I think for this to flourish, there needs to be the ability to access data, harness data to create that real personalized content. And that's the key for me, being able to harness that data to create a, a more personalized experience. Great. And, and Valerie, what do you think? Well, I'll, I'll be the voice of the platform you know, the, the plumber of the advertising space here. Um, well, I, I think, again, it's it's um, an exciting opportunity that we're seeing there are lots of things to, to build in order to achieve what we all dream of. Um, but one of the, my perspective is that one of the most uh, uh, important thing we have to all keep in mind is um, the consumer. So, um, again, it, it's been said personalization, but also the respect of um, the privacy. And in Europe, we've been, um, pretty um, uh, future thinking in terms of uh, privacy. Um, so th these are stuff that we'll have to keep in mind, but uh, we are all super excited to build on that new programmatic channel. So let's make it happen. Great. And before I pass it back to Simon, um, I think I'll wrap up by saying I, I, I personally feel like the programmatic audio space and, and voice is very exciting. But Valerie, you mentioned something very important, and that's always a consumer and often when we see new devices being put into market, um, we often try and think of a way that we transplant what we've done before into a new space. And you can't stick a TV ad into a voice speaker. And having listened to podcasts this morning on the way into work that were a year old and I was getting ads for movies that weren't there anymore, you have to think about when people access podcasts and actually what they're doing at that time. And I think as an industry, our biggest challenge is to think beyond just reach and thinking beyond the numbers and actually think about how people are using the devices and how they're consuming the media and what's the right message for that device. Um, I think the voice space is particularly, um, I think there's some particularly bad work happening in the voice space. And I think that is just because people aren't thinking consumer first. They're thinking about how can I smack a TV ad onto a speaker? And it just doesn't work. And for me, rather than scaring off clients by saying no one's doing it very well, actually, there's a huge opportunity to do it well. And my hope is that everyone on this call today will go back to their desks or wherever they are and have a think about how consumers are using these devices differently and what the opportunity is for their brands in that space. So I'd like to thank the panel today. It's a really interesting conversation. We've run over because it's such a great topic. But um, like David was saying, do check out the IAB's website and go back and listen to the podcast again. And now I'm going to hand back to Simon. So thank you very much, everyone. I thought that was a really interesting call and echo Liam's comments around um, creativity. That's coming up later in the agenda as well. We're just going to do a, a little bit of shuffle and people in a sec, but also there is a programmatic audio survey. Uh, that uh, is, is gaining more insight. And so this survey will be set like for everyone after the event. Um, and please take place by this Friday, the 10th of May. Looks like there's an opportunity to win a voucher as well, which is excellent. Uh, and that will help everyone in the space understand more. But once again, thank you to all the panelists and excuse a tiny bit of noise changeover as we shuffle people. <laughs> So um, the beauty of, of this format is we're also using people in different markets and different spaces uh, able to join to make sure we're getting a representative group of voices. So it's really exciting for me to hopefully be able to hand over to Lisa, uh, who is not in the room with me right now, but is going to 
to moderate this panel and um, I'll leave you to the guests to introduce yourselves and, and take through. But I'm really looking forward to where we're going with native advertising. Good luck. Thanks, Simon. Um, I hope you guys can hear me and I wish I could be in the room to join you guys. Um, but wanted to introduce uh, the native panel. And while we go through introductions, um, I think there's so many different native definitions that we are actually post, uh, posting a questionnaire and would love to get you, uh, everyone's feedback into um, how they define native. So I think Marie Claire was gonna post that into the questions group. And if we can get that feedback. Um, while the rest of the panel introduce themselves. I'm Lisa, I run demand for Pomatic in the UK. My name is Liv Ekhoff, I'm head of ad products in Shipstead, Norway. Hello, I'm Clementina Piazza and I'm programmatic director in for Integral Ad Science. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Darko. I am the programmatic associate director uh, uh, for PVU Mediacom. So great, I think everyone is in the process of filling that out. Um, I don't know that I have the results just yet, um, but the way that IAB has actually uh, defined native is based on the ad units uh, used for automated distribution, scale, that lookout format. I think while I was looking through, uh, trying to find other definitions, I think the main point of it was that it is it does look like it's part of the content, but it is paid for by advertisers. So I think it um, was really important in the conversations that we had to understand really why native and what would make an advertiser want to run a native campaign instead of an app. And I think Danielle, you were gonna start us off. Yes. Um, so basically, um, thank you so much for defining what native is. So it's a format that takes place in different environments. Um, for instance, um, it's it looks uh, it can go onto a news site and it looks like it's a news article, but it's not. Um, it can also be brought in different environments, such as uh, the in-app environment or the desktop environment, the tablet environment or the mobile web environment. So Native has come a long way in many, many years and it keeps evolving. And the good news is it's also available in any environment now globally. <clears throat> Yeah, I would I would agree to that. I think in Shipstead, we uh, in Norway we have multiple different types of sites where we offer native. So we have some marketplaces, and we also have newspapers, and we offer native across those sites and across all platforms, basically. So in app, on web, and uh, desktop through mobile. Great, thanks so much, Liz. So I think in understanding um, what native actually is defined at, I think it's important to see what, how, what and how it impacts the uh, advertising ecosystem. So Clementina, I know you had some feedback for us. Um, yes, thank you. I'm happy to <clears> take <throat> that. Um, I think I had many points uh, kind of in preparing for this, but I'll try to be, you know, um, as concise as possible, I picked a few. So I think, I mean, how it impacts in particular the programmatic, obviously, advertising ecosystem. I think native advertising and programmatic uh, really complement each other quite effectively. Because programmatic, when well executed, of course, <laughs> delivers um, like scale and efficiency, right? Enabling buyers really to target ads to relevant audiences. And native, on the other hand, um, allows to expose those relevant audiences to um, a message that is articulated using a language and a reference points that are closer to them and the content that they're consuming. So um, to me, really, what native, uh, you know, one of the first things that I would like to outline is that native has contributed to bring to the forefront again the importance of what is that you serve, the creative, uh, meaning that you can put in place the smartest and most refined targeting strategy, but uh, its outcome truly is going to be only as good as how engaging and compelling uh, what you serve actually is. And uh, I mean, we've seen that when brand tailor um, like the, their native advertisement to the target audience, tastes and preference, uh, like in the right media, uh, the results are fairly remarkable. We've seen that like native ads trigger between like 20 and 60 percent, if I'm not mistaken, like higher interaction than standard display badness. And off the back of that, another thing I wanted to point out is that I feel 
what Native has done is that it has made dynamic creative optimization, or DTO in the lingo, <laughs> more scalable and affordable. Um, like the enabling factor, of course, in that sense was the uh, that, that version 1.2 of the Open RTP Native Ads API had uh, as one of their core feature, uh, its core feature, uh, like the, the support for dynamic content and third-party ad serving support. And I think another element to highlight um, is how it made, uh, we've touched upon mobile, right? How it made user experience better on mobile. And some people actually would say that Native as a whole um, originally was created to enhance the mobile advertising experience. And I think off the back of that, this is why it's predicted that I think around 60% of global mobile ad spend will be on Native by 2020. And I think lastly, one thing that really struck me is that, and I hadn't really my bad thought of, is that it also, like it provided for a more effective way of delivering effective advertising at a scale for verticals like finance or insurance, because it, it, it gave a medium to convey complex product information in a way that's easier to understand. And I mean, I think we, some of us have been there. I mean, it, it's kind of hard in those instances to address the complexity of those products uh, through most like standard display formats. Great, thanks so much for the thoughts. And I think in understanding all of the benefits that Native has uh, done to the ecosystem and how it's impacted it, um, from a publisher perspective, what do you believe, Liv, are the key challenges and benefits to programmatic Native? Well, as a publisher, let me start with the benefits then, because it's nicer than starting with the <laughs> with the challenges. I think um, we, first and foremost, it's uh, being able to offer native pro programmatically as an opportunity for us to offer a, a premium ad format uh, to our advertisers that offers a better user experience, and therefore, I think also that is uh, the main reason why we can also give our advertisers better effect through that product. And the other way, the other thing is that native is, is a, a, an efficient way of purchasing advertising since the buy side only needs one set of assets. So uh, it offers us also flexibility to, to use our inventory in a more efficient way because we, we know which assets are coming in and it's up to us to, to put those assets together and render them in the way that we would like. So it's uh, it enables us to use our, our inventory in, a, in an even better way. And then- would, uh, Just a question yeah. on that, sorry. Would you say that an original adoption then took longer because it is unique ad units that weren't standard for, the, for what we are used to in the system? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess you could say that. And then, but then I think on the on the challenges, side uh, sort of with the with the flexibility it gives us that that also drives complexity so uh, and I think that's um, a challenge for the buyer so I'm sure uh, Danielle will come back to that yeah that it's uh, but it's also a challenge for us to to both um, maintain and operate the different uh, ad unit stylings and uh, and specs that we have across our sites and communicate those specs in an efficient way to the buy side um, to be able to, to provide them with a spec that's always up to date and also I think uh, to be able to, to actually preview to the buyers what they're buying when they're buying native advertising on our sites because there is no way to know uh, how your assets are actually going to be rendered on our sites before they go live. Completely agree with that. Thanks so much, Liz. So I think you kind of gave the perfect entrance for uh, my next question to Danielle is understanding what the key challenges and benefits for buyers are. And also I think it, like the complexity of the ecosystem would be great. Definitely. Um, I'm going to start with the challenges, picking <laughs> it up. <laughs> so I would say, um, you know, the key challenge here is, uh, from the buyer's point of view, is from understanding the moment that you recommend this format is one size does not fit all. It's not like display or video where we're told, okay, you need a 300 by 250. It can't go higher than 100 MB. It's different when it comes to native. 
You need to know beforehand which partner you want to use, which DSP you want to use. How are you buying it? Are you buying it on the open exchange or are you going to use the publisher's whitelist? From there, you are then understanding what are the specifications that I need to use. Have we been whitelisted to use that publisher on this particular DSP? So those are the key challenges. People need to have that information ready before they can go ahead to start building a native campaign. Um, so the challenge there is until you go through those challenging times, you're not aware of it. So we need better communication across every from the DSP to the publishers to us, the agency, before we can go ahead and uh, recommend this native and run in this native. So that's one of the key challenges. So one size does not fit all at all. <laughs> yeah, can I chime in there? I yeah. think also that, I mean, there is progress on that, but there's Definitely. the lack, lack of standardization of, of what the ad assets uh, are to be uh, across publishers and also across DSPs. So. Uh, from from our perspective, one of the challenges we see is that the, the different DSPs have different inputs for uh, for assets, yes. and we um, we have uh, that also challenge makes it challenging for us to design the native ad units in a way that uh, enables all buyers to to buy our ads in an efficient way. One of the the benefits for that is these challenges, uh, that main challenge, we have seen the benefits now, where some DSPs, for instance, in their help guide, they have it listed based on the top um, native partners or the open exchange, and they tell you these are the specifications you need to know. These are the ones that are integrated with a third-party verification tool, such as Moat or IS, the ones that don't have that, uh, which partners you need to whitelist according to which country. So they are adopting it, but it would be good if it's faster because I think it'll be more beneficial for not just um, the publishers or the buyers, but most importantly, the client as well. So they have this information at their fingertips. So that's the challenge. Um, and when it comes to the benefits, there's a lot. <laughs> One is um, it allows optimum reach for your campaign. Um, for instance, um, you don't just want to be seen on display and video. You can also reach a user uh, on in the native format in a different environment. So that's maximum reach, which is fantastic. It also gives you a chance of um, being quite unique. It's authentic, the native ad. Um, as was mentioned earlier on this call, it's also about giving some bit more cl complex understanding to the product, for instance, especially with something like in the finance market that was also highlighted. You need that bit of more information as opposed to click here now or buy more. You need to understand a bit more about that product, especially for um, uh, products that are, it's not easy to just convert to a user. They have to read more about it before they make that decision. Another key benefit as well for us buyers is if we go into the mindset of the standard purchase funnel, at the very top you have awareness, then you have consideration and engagement, and then finally purchasing the product. This native is fantastic for driving engagement and consideration because it brings that user to have a bit more understanding on the product. And if they have lost interest, it can help bring them back as well. Also, you can measure different kinds of metrics on there. That is also very good for Native. You can see if they have clicked on the widget, have they shared this content? Because Native is shareable, of course. Um, you can see um, if they have gone straight to the landing page as well. So you can get a lot more insight as well compared to some formats out there. So loads of benefits. <laughs> Thanks so much, Danielle, and I think that leads perfectly into the next question of talking about programmatic advertisement and measure uh, from na pro programmatic native and how we would go about measuring it. So, Clementina, I think you're the perfect person to ask. Yes, and also, I mean, I think in, in responding to this, um, 
I would like to focus on the viewability aspect in particular, um, because it's one of the most the ones that most commonly comes up in in our day to day work with clients, especially in terms of like concerns, struggles, doubts, uh, and because you know the big part of this kind of events is about education and you know putting everyone on the same level of what everyone should be aware of. I think you know uh, that would, viewability would be a great starting point. So bear with me uh, for a couple of minutes because there's a couple of elements to this. Um, so although, um, so version 1.2 of the OpenRTP native ads API, which we've mentioned before, right, enhanced the support for event tracking, viewability included. It's important to understand that what that referred to was to enable supply sources to declare what the events, which events they can track, and to enable demand sources to request events to be tracked in a structured way. But uh, I mean, and then it can be, of course, that supply sources leverage third party verifications, right, as well as proprietary tools to define that viewability event. However, when it comes to buy side, like third party independent viewability measurement, which we are in, um, it, was, it was traditionally tricky to leverage the same methodology for viewability measurement based on JavaScript that we use for standard ads. And here is where it gets a little bit more technical, but I'm glad we're recording this because this is crucial to understand why sometimes we come across uh, certain struggles. So the reason for that impossibility of using the same methodology that I was referencing before is that native ads are not inside iframes. They're typically at the same level of markup as the other elements they're uh, disguised with, in a sense, right? So in other words, what, that, that, what does that mean, right? In other words, native sits outside what we call, in like technical terms, a div. And a div is an HTML element that basically indicates the size of an area. So to recap, the fiddly part then is that traditionally, in order to measure viewability consistently, you need that third-party tracker um, to be in the same container as the creative. So how do we address it then if it's, you know, what, how, what, what do we do from there? So the preferred approach today is to add an additional parameter that directs that third-party measurement tracker to the appropriate unique CSS selector for viewability measurement. And again, in brackets, for those that uh, are not quite accustomed to what CSS is, is the language that describes the presentation, basically the different components of an HTML document. And again, in more simple words, what, does, what, what it does basically, it basically tells the tags, so those third party trackers, the exact HTML element to treat as the creative in order to trigger the measurement. So that's how we do it today. Now, the intricacy of all of this is like great. So there is a workaround for more consistent um, measurement when it comes to viewability and native, yes. The intricacy part that still stands, however, is that how to best deploy that additional parameter varies very much among different providers. So again, we fall into the one size does not fit all. And I know, you know, IS as other verification partners, we take you know as our day-to-day -day job to work with those native providers and kind of almost productize the way uh, native uh, me measurement for viewability aspects such as viewability is done for native because it's a case by case again provider by provider it might need to be tweaked so sorry for the spiel but it was <laughs> necessary like it's uh, uh, it's probably one of the most commonly um touched upon topics of like issues around consistent like uh, you know measurement when it comes to viewability on native. Thanks so much for that Clem. I think we all uh, understood measurement a little bit better from native and I think the one other piece would be great. Danielle I know you spoke a lot about um, the benefits of the native campaigns but have you found that they perform better than display and kind of what metrics do you use from the buy side or what metrics would you want to use? Um, that's a interesting question, um, simply because it's it, it, comparing native to another format against one KPI, it's, it's almost like um, apples and pears, um, because they could they 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 have um, 
different objective, if that makes sense. Um, but what I have seen um, to compare that is it has a stronger engagement uh, with native, such as you see a better CTR with native as opposed to your standard display. Um, you also have seen um, higher viewability compared to your standard display because as people are staying to read the content on there and it's not intrusive whatsoever. It just seems to be blending into the material that they're reading anyway. So, so if we can compare those two like a, a, a some fruit, then I would say that it performs better than display when it comes to engagement metrics, yes. Awesome, thanks so much for that. Maybe the key to measuring programmatic is just looking at it like a fruit salad. Um, <laughs> yes. So I think just to wrap up, um, be great to understand the key creativity considerations, because I know, Danielle, you spoke about them, um, and I know Liv mentioned them as well, and then also from a measurement perspective, Clem talked about them as well. So what would you guys say, starting with kind of the buyer, um, the key creativity consideration? I think um, one of the key lessons um, for all of us here is communication is key. That's what I'd like to start off with. So when it comes to the creative recommendations, um, the moment we decide which publisher or DSP, it's important that everyone is aligned and everyone communicates from the beginning so we can come up with, okay, what is the material that we're trying to portray here for this particular campaign? Uh, what images, what pixels, um, uh, what is the correct uh, pixel specifications, how heavy is it? Okay, we have 50 characters to put in or 90 characters to put in. Um, you know what is the recommendation to drive the best performance publishers at the end of the day would also have experience just like us the agency um with enough clients and they would also have their best practice and it's important that we also listen to them then of course with the dsp it's to to make sure that whatever is being built within their platform actually gets the inventory <laughs> thanks so much for that i think communication is key for everyone I think Live from a publisher perspective. Yeah, I would actually agree. Maybe I mean, yeah, when we've established those, or as we establish those best practices and have more experience and learn more, I think it's important that the, also the the technology and the and the specs are standardized so that it it doesn't only come down to us communicating better, but that it's it's easier from a day to day perspective as well in operations. To, to buy and to operate native advertising. Definitely agree, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, go ahead, Kat. No, I just wanted to add, uh, like from my perspective, uh, from what I was mentioning, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the benefits, um, I'm gonna say something quite controversial maybe, but, uh, and it applies to native because of all of the considerations around creativity, and uh, you know, like different components and the, that level of depth that it can offer. Um, like I don't like there's a lot of talks around to what extent uh, um, you know the standard kind of viewability definitions or viewability as a whole. It's a relevant uh, um, kind of you know alone as a standalone is it, it's relevant for native. Uh, and if you know on the other hand we should focus more on you know more in-depth attention metrics such as you know the amount of time um, you know someone is spending with a particular asset because if they do sit right if native sits at the cross line between uh, you know advertisement and content creation really the time element becomes um, in my view and you know our previous experience like it, it becomes really probably something that we should be focusing on more than, you know, the, the ratio between percentage of pixels in view and time. Thanks so much for that. So I think, um, thank you ladies for your opinions and expertise. I think as everyone's probably been sitting on the edge of their seats waiting to hear what the results are of the poll, just to wrap up, I think we had 44% uh, think that it is the first definition that is based on ad units used for the automated distribution of content at scale um, that align with the environment. Now, 40% defined it as material in an online publication, which resembles the content, but is the paid for with key. And then the, we only had 16% that just said it was a simple paid for advertising content. Um, so thank you 
guys so much for your expertise. I'm going to actually hand it back to Simon. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everybody. Um, a tremendous panel and, uh, you know, really interesting. I think we could have probably talked for another half hour on that, but unfortunately, uh, we have other topics that we're going to move on. So I think we've heard the challenge of creativity and focusing more on creativity in both of the panels we've just spoken about. Uh, and so now we're going to transition into a panel exclusively focused on that question. How do we use programmatic to power creative advertising? Um, and as the guys just join this room and, and sit down, and I think, uh, and hopefully we have Julie on the phone as well to join, uh, I'm going to hand you over to Andrew Buckman, who is COO Global of Sublime. Uh, and take it away, Andrew, he's a master at these panels. So uh, looking forward to see what we hear in this one. See you in a bit. Uh, thank you, Simon. Oh, I hope I can live up to the pressure yeah, of, the, uh, of the introduction. But thank you. Okay, great. So, hi, everyone. So, um, we're here today. We're going to be talking about uh, using programmatic to power creative advertising. Um, so, really, this has come from um, sort of many years of programmatic advertising becoming more and more the norm. Uh, many agencies are now saying that they want to be 100% programmatic within the next one, two, or three years. Um, and programmatic always had that um, impression that it was just there for remnant traffic and for performance traffic. Um, and now we're seeing it being used more and more in, in branding campaigns and general awareness campaigns um, and uh, sort of a lot of the, the, the major portions of traffic from, from different publishers is, um, is, is being sold programmatically. So the question bodes now is, is how can actually we use um, programmatic to be more creative uh, and to have more um, creative advertising to enable more storytelling perhaps, or, or better formats, or, or, or better looking ads, which, which mesh better with what users are expecting or, or how they behave on, on different sites. So um, to, to help answer these, these burning questions, uh, we've got uh, in the room with me, uh, Lucia Mastromaro and Amy China Wire, and then on the phone, well, Judy Selman. So I think if I'd like you all to Introduce yourselves. I'm looking at Amy first. Can I give us a talk? Picture on who you are. Hi everyone. Um, yep. So I'm Amy. I work for Teeds, and I head up the Teeds Studio part of the business. Um, been with Teeds coming up for two, three years in September. I was actually at Brainiant prior to that. Um, Brainiant were acquired by Teeds back in uh, 2016, um, and we are now powering all of Teeds' creative, um, offering creative solutions to clients. Um, across the uh, the global media platform. Super, thank you. Hi, Lucia Mastromaru. Uh, been a kind of a um, creative and ad tech and programmatic has been a long journey in my career. Uh, started uh, at eBay, where we built our own ad tech solution to power personalized creatives back in 2010. Then from eBay, I joined Google, uh, the double click team that about three years or so there. Uh, after that, I joined uh, King, Activision uh, Blizzard Media, um, to start and build the publisher business, the video publisher business that's now quite successful and thriving. And uh, after that, moved to the US as a headquarters. I joined Adform, which were old friends of mine from the time, uh, well, old competitors of mine from the time I was at DoubleClick. Uh, and now I head up uh, global agency development. So working with agencies to help them be sophisticated on their ad tech approach. Great, thank you. And Julie? Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, very well. Great. So um, thanks for having me. I'm currently in Brighton, so uh, at another event, so I couldn't make it, um, unfortunately. But um, my name is Julie Selman. Um, I'm currently um, at Freewheel, uh, and I head up a Freewheel Media for the UK and Northern Europe. Um, and Basically, uh, what we do is uh, video, a programmatic and, and managed service um, video um, uh, inventory sales, basically, to agencies, uh, trading desks, brands. And previously, I was at Taboola, so the native uh, conversation uh, before was very interesting for me as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. 
Great, thanks, Julie. So whilst um, uh, whilst you're kind of up on the on the stage, today, um, I think I'll, I'll get the first question for you, which is, what's what do you define as programmatic creative? Sorry, I had to un, un, unmute. Uh, I had to go on mute for a second. Um, so yeah, so um, obviously when we were preparing for this um, uh, conversation. Uh, we figured it'd be good to give a, sort of a definition. Um, I don't know the official definition, to be honest, um, but uh, for me, um, programmatic creative is really all about um, reaching the right audience with the right message. Um, so personalizing um, your ads uh, and make them relevant to those audiences uh, with, this, with the specific uh, uh, ad uh, that matches that group. Um, and which is great, obviously, through programmatic, this has been uh, much easier to do. Um, there's more data available. It's uh, easily uh, automated. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, but there are some drawbacks as well, which I guess we'll be discussing um, during this panel. Great, thanks. Um, and I mean, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so I guess, um, you know, so from, a, from a programmatic creative point of view, I mean, programmatic was originally brought into advertising for two reasons, one to automate buying and two for marketing to marketers to deliver at a single impression level applying creative to that is not just finding the single impression you want but also the perfect creative for that individual uh, I also like to see it as a way of moving moving away from generic creative uh, it's a way of harnessing data and technology available to deliver an ad in real time across multiple devices according to their interests time of day and what they're doing okay great but it's hard to add to that uh, without you know, um, going over some of those points again. But in my view, programmatic creative, if, if you look at what majority of programmatic activity the creative is a standard creative or is a rotation of creative, depending on a little bit of targeting. Ideally, programmatic creative would be, uh, would be executed and, and come to fruition in full synchrony uh, under the same targeting structure as the programmatic media buying campaign. So using the same backbone that you use to find that perfect impression for that perfect user, make that power, the programmatic creative, in one loop rather than having to, you know, have teams in different offices trying to get to the same end goal, but without necessarily communicating, which is some of the challenges that we can talk about later uh, on the, the on this space, but ideally is being able to storytell to the user um, through not just the media and the place where they are sitting, but also through the right message based on where they are at that point. So not trying to go into the old, you know, you know right place, right this, right that, but using the same backbone structure, uh, which I think it's still where a lot of the limitations are. Okay. Right, perfect. So yeah, so it sounds like the three of you are saying it's really programmatics there as a platform to enable all the different moving parts and there's a lot of complex different moving parts that to be used together. Mm -hmm. So if we if we get down a little bit more into the nitty gritty, Amy, mm -hmm. about how that actually does work. I mean, mm -hmm. how how do you think that programmatic technologies can, can help marketers to deliver more relevant messages and creatives? So I guess uh, DCO is integral here, right? So on a very basic level, it's using data points to affect creative. Um, so this is going to enable the delivery of a more relevant ad experience based upon that specific data signal at the moment of, uh, of ad serving. Mm -hmm. uh, this personalization combined with testing and optimization as well means that dynamic ads typically outperform other ad formats, uh, sometimes by a significant margin. Um, the hyper, This hyper relevancy that's created by DCA also ensures uh, that brands are talking to the right people at the right time with the right message, as we've said. Um, and then, of course, there are um, a multitude of different approaches of which uh, I know we're going to talk about again. Yeah, okay. And then, um, what about uh, Julia? I mean, are, are there any of the, the kind of the platform aspects that you see from your company that you think are relevant in this case? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is, um, at least what we're seeing, is that although a lot is possible at the moment, it also uh, will uh, obviously reduce um, your reach. And what we're seeing, that's one of the biggest challenges that nowadays you can do a lot. There's a lot of data, but there's almost too much. 
And so that brings a lot of challenges in, in, in delivering um, at scale. Okay, great. And Monsieur, you want to comment on that one? Um, so my experience with Dynamic Creative this year, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of twofold. I mean, the current technology that, and almost a uh, school of thought of these days, which looks at DCO from an audience perspective and tries to leverage DMP data mm -hmm. and so on to customize that creative. So in principle, it assumes you need to know a lot about the user to be able to customize that creative. Back nine years ago, when I was at eBay, I was the client at eBay, we built our own tech tool um, before the wave of programmatic. So we didn't really have that luxury of choosing which user to buy an impression for. We just had to make the best uh, of, uh, out of what we had in terms of every impression that would get served. We just had to make the best out of that impression with a DCO type solution. And I don't think necessarily that the limitation is there in that way. What we did was we constructed a rule set that made decisions throughout the way and all the creatives were dynamic, even when we had zero data on the user. Um, so do we know anything about this user? No, that was about 50% of everybody that we served the creative to. But we still build goals within the kinds of campaigns and products that we wanted to market that kind of switched the, the creative around. So I think that kind of approach is very helpful for CPGs, for those brands that have limited data, especially after GDPR. Mm -hmm. And then obviously for those where you have a lot of data, you have consent, then you can kind of become a little bit more um, nitty gritty to exactly what message you want to mm -hmm. send to that one user. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't be aiming to storytell. And I think that's where, you know, creative agencies par partnering with media agencies or creative teams within media agencies or publishers with clients can consult and help kind of bring that thinking a little bit out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have the goal of what you can achieve, then you can tinker around, mm -hmm. you know, with the technology that's available to deliver that. But I think a lot of the industry is kind of caught in this rabbit hole of thinking, oh my God, we don't have that much data anymore. But I think that there are signals you can use without necessarily being just the audience signal of that user. Yeah. Definitely. I, I to add to that actually we so at teeth i mean yeah with the gdpr regulations mm -hmm. in play we we kind of look uh, outside of that and we look at you know things like location um so doing a certain amount of G, um, geolocation around gdpr but also mm -hmm. um, behavioral um you know kind of the basics of demographics and also also context as well uh, so the context of an advert we know is everything right so exactly. in a nutshell um context of specific messaging you know delivered to the right user based on what content they're reading from a different publisher yeah and a dco solution like you yeah. have like we have can pick up on those and, and with the and i think one thing is missed a little bit is just the creative talent mm. to to think those strategies up, um, not to criticize at all, you know, the execution of programmatic, but it, programmatic has put the industry a little bit into that very um, mathematical yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, creative can become quite yeah. mathematical, but I think a little bit of, um, you know, taking many steps back and yeah. whiteboarding what one wants to achieve mm -hmm. in that campaign is still very much doable. In yeah, these days. definitely. Just bringing that sort of art and science yeah. slash mm -hmm. mathematics together. Yeah. Okay, so that segues quite nicely into our, our first poll question, which um, you should all see up on, on the screen. So is, is we're really, we're, and we're, we've touched on quite a lot of this already, but we'll have a, a maybe look at some of the points we haven't addressed so far. But um, the, main, the main question is, like, what are the key challenges regarding creative optimization? Um, and there's a couple of items there linked to data, which, we, which we've talked about just now. Um, and some of that is the availability of the data, some of that is the ability to interpret the data. Uh, but then there's also um, a couple of items which are linked to this um, kind of design element that you've been talking about is, do we have the, the skills to be able to create multiple versions of the same creative mm -hmm. to then be able to test? I mean, I'm, um, I'm old enough to have done direct marketing campaigns <laughs> in mail, and it was, it was, it was all about doing A-B testing, and you send out basically the same letter with um, 10 different versions, but there's always there's just one word that's changed or, or one color in one different area of the page. And 
now things have got a lot more complex because you've got video in there, you've got audio, you've got interactivity, you've got um, different device sizes and, and, and connection speeds. Um, I mean, how, how do you address that particular challenge this year of, of, of being able to have different types of creative which are essentially doing the same message and then being able to analyze how effective they are? Well, uh, I can answer that from two hats, right? I can answer with ad forms hat, which um, I would say we make it simple, <laughs> and I can explain why, how, and I can answer that with my old, you know, client hat back at eBay, where there was a time where we would have 19 campaigns in a month across 10 countries. Each campaign would have 10 different sizes. So if you do the maths, it was thousands of creatives that we had to tra traffic and try to storytell with. So I do uh, relate to anybody who's saying the complexity of multiple versions can be quite daunting. Um, but I do think that we are in, like, we have moved on so much uh, with the in industry and availability of, of DCO type solutions that, you know, there is no reason why you should be needing to make loads of versions. I know that there are some, you know, some offers in the market that will say they are doing, uh, you know, most, you know, create storytelling, but in reality they create multiple versions. Uh, but um, but there is automation. For example, AppForm, uh, the D, the DCO in itself works as a standalone solution, so it will handle all the data and all the versionings. And, and, and it's very easy to kind of create new, uh, like as a self-service solution, create new uh, uh, campaigns and, and, and break that down with infinite amounts of targeting. As a ad serving and DCO solution, the ad server already does a lot of the, you know, legwork for the DCO because it captures all the data in there. If you have a DMP as well, that further uh, enhances that for the user. So I'm not trying to sell in here, but uh, but I, what I would say is that's the solution I represent, but there is a lot of solutions in the market that can, uh, you know, take a lot of that complexity out, that can help, help with the restrictions in terms of ITP as well, depending on how that solution handles third party versus first party uh, and what other signals you can get from that in regards to uh, other type data. Uh, with regards to GDPR, that's a that's an interesting thing, which I think I'm a little bit at two minds, and I will shut up soon. Uh, which I know that the industry has felt quite um, has felt that GDPR has massively re reduced the amount of data available, mm -hmm. and that has hit a lot of people quite hard. But on the positive side, from a user perspective and it has it has also reduced the amount of aimless you know follow me type market uh which just you know targets users on what is perceived to be you know the the the, the, the segments that they belong to um the products that they might be interested on so i think that that it has reduced the bad actors in the market, mm -hmm. which means that the good actors in the market that have genuine data, that the data is content-based, are now able to actually demonstrate their 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 value and, and, and bring their creative to shine. Mm -hmm. I'll put that, I don't know, for you guys. Well, I'm just, I'm just gonna, as, as we're on that, I'm just gonna throw one in, which is a bit tough, because this is very unfair to Amy, because Amy landed <laughs> 1 a.m. this morning from holiday. So, but um, so Google have just announced that they're going to be making changes to Chrome, um, which gives the users more control over um, how cookies are used and gives them the ability potentially to block cookies. Mm -hmm. And there's there's different um, reports on how far it goes and and what cookies are going to be blocked and what are not going to be blocked. Um, of course, in Apple and Safari, have um, have also got these controls in, which have probably more strict than, than Google is saying that those are going to be. Mm -hmm. However, Chrome controls 80% of internet traffic today. So 80% of the traffic that goes on the internet. So, and Julie, I'm going to ask this of you first because it's going to be unfair to ask Amy. Um, what, what do you do in, or what do you think we can do in a, in a cookie-less environment? Um, I mean, we've been, we've been looking at this on mobile for quite a while, but this is going to be desktop as well. Um, if um, Chrome does 
block all cookies and uh, and targeting based on, on cookies is, is impossible and all we have is the first party data or contextual data uh, or potentially uh, geo-targeting. Um, what, what do you think are our abilities and opportunities in terms of um, using programmatic creatively? Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think you just said it there. I think uh, contextual will be Come very important um, again and, and more than before um, because it will be uh, one of the only ways I guess to sort of still get a sense of your audience and and how to target them um, and contextual you can relate it also easily to the creative so I think that would be the let's say the most straightforward solution okay and then so in, in terms of DCO I mean you both have DCO tools as, as part of your suite. I mean, how, how do you see that happening? Either of you. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much um, a tricky one. I mean, I guess um, we, with, at Tease, we are benefiting from the fact that we are very heavily about context because we you know, work with hundreds of premium publishers. Um, so the DCO piece is, uh, is, uh, is, is quite tricky uh, with the cookie situation. But I guess, um, you know, kind of maybe sort of bring it back to the kind of creative storytelling side of it um, and looking at, you know, kind of how we can uh, change the creative messaging based on the, on the user journey from, you know, kind of awareness consideration to conversion in that way and, uh, and affect the creative from, you know, kind of the nice sort of big video hero piece from awareness. Uh, driving it down to consideration where we have something that's more kind of you know viewable display uh, or interactive video and then taking it down to conversion um, so maybe just taking it back to I guess back to basics to some extent um, from how we target these from a storytelling point of view. Yeah I think from our point of view there are a few angles to it but platform is a full stack by itself side so there are some countries where we have a high penetration on the sell side we have an SSP as well so in there we have already a sort of a first party uh, solution. We also have a cookless solution, uh, but to just go into the buy side, which would be the DCO itself for advertisers and agencies, with a as a standalone, or with all the some or all the other pieces of the stack, um, say ad server and, uh, for example, DSP or uh, DMP. I think the more the user, our our clients use not just one solution but multiple solutions. The more data they will have to play. So if they are serving all of their campaigns with us, uh, the ad server is seeing all the impressions that they are serving and being able to kind of um, make sure that they track that user journey and and can story tell across multiple publishers, for example. Um, if they're also using the DMP, there's levels of data that they can augment within the DMP that can feed the DCO and the programmatic campaign. So it, I think it depends on you know, operating in isolation versus operating at scale. Um, that will improve what they can do from a DCO perspective. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is, you know, I, I was very deep into creative before the programmatic wave, before data was widely available. And I remember a time where we could be quite creative, even though we had those limitations. So I don't see why the industry should panic too much. There will always be, you know, tsunamis and waves being thrown by bigger companies or walled gardens and uh, either by policy needs or by, you know, market moves. But, uh, but we will find a way forward. And I think you know, there, this is an opportunity to, to be more relevant and to bring your brands forward with more innovation creativity. Excellent. So there is hope. I yeah. think there is yeah. hope. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a positive thinking Thank person. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So just to close up the, um, the poll, so just over half of you have voted. Um, and it seems to be fairly tight. So, so the, the one that's, that's really most popular is um, this complexity of actually being able to create multiple versions of the same creative. And, and I think that that is an age old problem as well, is, is like how do you how do you differentiate between um, different creatives and, and just how far do you let the creative team actually run riot <coughs> in creating new stuff and what is interesting to test. Exactly. Um, seems to be that most of you are comfortable actually um, 
deciding how to interpret data and, and, and what tools to use to do that if you can get hold of it. Uh, but it also seems to be that the, the availability of the data is a concern, and that was the first the first point you raised yeah. this year. So um, definitely one to look out for. So um, let's take a kind of quick look back now, um, and and maybe look at some case studies of um, of how create, programmatic creative optimization has actually worked. Um, and Amy, I mean, what what kind of things have you done at, at T Studio to in this area? So. Um... So I guess there's, 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 you know, there's a few kind of, uh, there's a few examples here, but one of the ones I wanted to focus on is, I guess, kind of taking it back um, to kind of making sure that you have the most relevant type of data depending on the brand's objectives. Um, what we found that has been most effective DCO campaigns are the ones that combine multiple data signals to deliver mass personalization at scale. Uh, so getting kind of away from that, kind of sort of closing the pool too much. Um, so we delivered a campaign for Ralph Lauren as part of their Wimbledon uh, sponsorship that leveraged data signals for weather, uh, so specifically geo-targeted to Wimbledon um, at the time of the tournament, which served a piece of branded video relevant to the weather conditions, combined with a product carousel uh, relevant to the user, which was based on the specific audience behaviour. Um, so that's the kind of thing. So we are, you know, we're taking that sort of basic level of data that is available. Weather, it's a great one. Uh, we like to love to talk about it in this country, um, and making it, you know, entirely relevant um, at the mass mass level. Oh, brilliant! That's really good. Excellent. So um, I think we've we've got another poll question, um, which we'll talk about. Quickly. We'll actually probably move on to talk about the future before we look at the details of that. So um, the um, how do we work this one? So we'd say that um, obviously programmatic is very sophisticated and versatile, but what do we think it will take um, to, to, to make creative optimization as sophisticated and versatile as programmatic is? Um, is that okay? Perfect. Um, so, uh, so really, is that is that down to tools? So we're we looking at more flexible user interfaces. Um, is it down to, to data, so better access to data, obviously this raises a concern earlier on. Um, I think better data, better tools to actually interpret that data. Um, and then maybe um, actually having the industry define it as success. Um, so it, my betting would go that the first two probably be more popular given the results of the previous poll. But um, what, uh, I mean, so sort of Julie, just um, to, to focus quickly on this question, um, I mean, what do you think, based on the discussion that we've had this morning, um, do you think that it will take creative optimization to be as, as fluid and sophisticated as, as we need it to be in this programmatic sector? Um, so, I think it's a mix of things, but um, definitely the interpretation of data uh, and the tools that come with it are going to be very important um, because you can have, uh, like we said before, hundreds of different creatives, um, but we don't, we need to know what really works and sort of be able to test and measure um, because that's the only way you're going to get the results you need. Um, and then I think there's for creative uh, optimization and just in general, there's the human side of things as well, what we said before as well. I mean, uh, data is great, um, the sort of maths to it is great, but you still need uh, the sort of human brain to have the the creative mind to come up with the different um, uh, creatives. So I think those two things are very important. And uh, in that sense, also creative departments working much closer with um, the people executing the campaign is, is very key. So that's not necessarily uh, an answer on your poll, but I think that's very important. So I should have added that one before mm -hmm. then when, when we did that. Hey, that's right. <laughs> Amy, what is, what I'm definitely course? reiterate yeah. um, and kind of build on, on what Julie said. So, um, collaboration is absolutely essential, mm -hmm. as it is with any creative project, right? So, communication with the creative team and then developing the assets is crucial to ensure that they are relevant and tailor made for the DCA solution and that they are aligned with the campaign targets and outcomes as well. Um, but also, kind of looking just forward um, as well, like next generation. Uh, self-assembled DCO is something that um, we've kind of been there been talking about teams, um, which involves feeding lots of different pieces of creative into the back end system and allowing machine learning right, to generate the relevant composite pieces of the video based on what we know of that user. Um, so for example, for an electrics company, this could be a two minute video created for a laptop, 
which moves through all the product features and benefits of the product, allowing the creative platform to take this content index and match it frame by frame to use it behavioral data and, uh, and recut, uh, render it in real time to allow us to deliver a more relevant video experience to a specific audience group. Uh, for example, the ad could focus on different features for different audience groups, such as showing security features to families and children. Excellent. Thank you. So yeah, as we're, as we're kind of looking forward, so I mean, and see what's your view on, on what's next. So I think, as you mentioned, there are challenges still on collaboration, and I think that is the biggest hindrance, really, uh, to making sure that cre the creative front is as sophisticated as pragmatic. From a that form perspective, our solution works in, in, in full synchrony. So one uh, targeting structure is the same for the programmatic as well as the creative and any creative that serves by a platform the the, the the system captures all the data all uh, all the interactions with that creative and already make them into um, into audience data to power the AI of the creative uh, solution the DCO solution but uh, you know I, so that us to that point where you know, more flexible user interfaces. I believe we have one of the most advanced full solutions for that in the market, especially if you are ad serving across most publishers. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a case for, for you know, solutions like yours, mm -hmm. where you're really tailored to a type uh, of media that you're, you, you're mm -hmm. operating as well. Um, but I think that the, the, the biggest challenge really goes back to the collaboration front, where media agencies and, and, and creative agencies are still not as collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, so the creative agencies aren't close to what ad tech solutions are there. The media agencies do understand programmatic really well, but still find it a little bit challenging to get their hands on themselves on creative solutions. Okay, excellent, thank you. So but there's hope. There is hope, there is hope. <laughs> so good, so we'll just, um, we'll wrap up quickly just by um, we're giving the results of that second poll. So um, it's a good job I'm not a betting, you know, because I've lost my money on that one. <laughs> um, so despite everyone thinking that, um, the, that we had sufficient tools to interpret data, I think we still need more tools to interpret data. Um, and it's, it's by far and away the most, the most popular response to that. So uh, I just want to thank my panelists for a very interesting session today. Thank you, and I will pass it back on to Simon. Thanks, Andrew. I think that's really interesting. And it's, I, well, well, I'm pleased that those results show that it's not necessarily metric standardization, yes. which shows progress itself. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, so thanks to everyone on that panel. We've now we've covered audio, we've covered programmatic native and emerging opportunities there, and how we can improve uh, creative advertising. And so now we're going to move on to everyone's favorite topic. But where are we with GDPR one year on? And what are the developments we're starting to see? So I'm going to get the guys to come into the room uh, and we will hand over shortly to Lindsay from Exchange Wire, who's going to moderate this panel. Uh, and hopefully we also have Stefan and Ed on the phone as two panelists who are going to join. So we're, we're hoping we're all good there. Um, so once Lindsay's done, we'll hand over to you. Great, thank you, Simon. Are you comfortable? I am very comfortable. Away we yeah. go. Off we go. Right, GDPR. Um, we're pretty much a year on, so it's a really good time to have this conversation. So first of all, I want to start with some introductions. So if we can go around the room and uh, everyone introduce themselves. Obviously, I am Lindsay. I'm head of content at Exchange Wire. Um, Townsend, let's start with you. Yeah, Townsend, Ian, CEO of IAB Europe, based in Brussels. Brilliant, thank you. Thomas. Thomas Jumo, uh, I'm an associate general counsel at, at Nexus. A Zander company. A Zander company. There we go. Yeah, you have to say it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed, over to you. Hi guys, uh, it's Ed Well here, managing director for UK and Spain at SpotX. And finally, Stefan. Hi, hello, Stefan Hanloser. I'm responsible for data protection law at Posim Z1. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So. Uh, I think it's a good chance for us to recap on kind of what kind of a year it's been for GDPR. We're pretty much a year on. I would like to understand from all of you how it's affected the industry from your different perspectives, kind of as where you sit in the industry. And if you think that GDPR has played out as we expected and kind of what more you think there is to come. So, um, Ed, let's start with you from the SpotX perspective. Hey, sure. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think it's clear that sort of GDPR has affected all industries uh, dramatically. I think even my mum knows about GDPR, uh, although wow. I vetoed it from the dinner table conversation. Um, but no, obviously, since uh, so much of our industry and ad tech relies around processing of personal data, I feel like we as an industry have felt a particularly significant pinch. And, you know, it's it's clearly had a huge effect. I don't think anyone on this panel is going to say it hasn't had a huge effect on every kind of player within the ad tech ecosystem and whether that's you know uh, personnel kind of resourcing uh, implications appointing dpos uh, you know assigning teams to handle data protection um, to let's say technical implications right publishers have to choose a cmp they have to implement a cmp maintain that cmp um, and i think also you know buyers and advertisers have been ultimately wary of purchasing in supply in supply chain where they couldn't be absolutely certain of you know the ability that they're safely uh, and legally targeting users so there's been a huge amount of uh, implications across different parties in the chain and i think it's ultimately led to an overarching trend that really all businesses have reevaluated their tech partners and i think you know the proliferation of so many data protection agreements between vendors and, and other vendors between platforms and publishers and you know even advertisers direct to publishers that's just put such a stress and I think we've you know we've got some some legal team members here and they'll probably attest to this they put such a stress on legal teams um, and businesses that they need to ultimately whittle down the number of partners that, that they work with um, so I think yeah as I said huge impact this year thus far yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Ed. And uh, a brilliant segue into kind of asking Tom the same question, kind of from the legal perspective, obviously also working on the tech side, kind of what impact have you seen? Has it played out the way you expected? This kind of this this pinch that Ed talked about. Well, thank you, Ed, first. Because uh, yes, <laughs> it's really been tough uh, last year and, and, and even in 2019. Um, so I, I think, you know, as a privacy lawyer, I would say that uh, the GDPR is really played out like we would expect it to 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 happen so in terms of like providing like the real impact of the GDPR is for the users not necessarily for the industry um, in terms of like the transparency that the user get now um, and 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 also the understanding of what's happening with their data when they're you know just browsing a website um, so I think it's really helped, even though my mother doesn't know what GDPR is, but uh, so I'm still having a hard time explaining <laughs> that. <laughs> I know, she's a tough cookie. Um, but yeah, so so really, I think in the, like for the industry, it's really helped um, kind of reshaping that, that relationship with users. Um, and I think with the, the, the framework, we've really made a, a major step in the right direction. Interesting. And Stefan, I want to come to you next, kind of from the publisher perspective, and, and especially sitting in Germany, the, their take on, on GDPR and how there's kind of their take on data privacy in general, and how you've experienced that versus maybe the rest of Europe. <laughs> well, I don't know how it was experienced in the rest of you. It usually in Germany, it's a little bit tougher and stricter. So mm. I think the most important thing is that uh, I think the different players in the game um, had have to have a discussion about the different roles. So um, publishers, ad networks, agencies, advertisers, and so on, who has which role and which responsibility. So it all started um, with this thorough discussion about who has to do what, who is legally accountable, um, who should be in the position to 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 collect consent um, or to think about legitimate interests? Who should respond to 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 um, user um, users' requests and so on? Uh, so I would say a year ago um, we received quite a large variety of different um, uh, proposals um, how, uh, what a what a, uh, um, a publisher should do and what its role should be in con um, in comparison to agencies or advertisers. Um, I think there's quite some harmonization by now, so everybody knows whether um, its specific role is, is, is as, a, as, a, as a, a data controller or as a processor, whether there's joint controllership or separate controllership. Um, so this is good. And the next step, of course, is um, to, 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 to understand this, this, the, the necessity to, to cooperate. 
So um, that um, the, 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 as, as, uh, the, the TCF shows, so that this is put into practice that uh, the, 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 the player responsible for collecting consent, uh, collects consent not, not just for, for, for himself, but also for those who rely on him, since we as publishers are the face to the users. So um, in short, um, understanding roles and responsibilities in the first year and understanding the need for cooperation and finding solutions like TCF. Brilliant, thank you. And, and you mentioned, Stefan, that the TCF Transparency and Consent Framework, which we will get onto in detail later. Um, but it, it sounds like I want to come to you now, from the Ivy Europe perspective, sitting where you do within the industry, how what, what your perspective on GDPR has been, how it's played out, and what you think we have learnt going into year two and how that will change. Uh, well, I think it's, it's been an absolutely fascinating year. And um, I would maybe um, uh, pick up and expand on what uh, uh, Thomas said about GDPR actually being uh, uh, an opportunity, turning out to be an opportunity for the industry to, uh, to, 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 to get it right. Um, I think in the first six months, we saw um, uh, a complete, um, you know, an equal amount of um, uh, uh, hard work and confusion and um, un un unreadiness to, um, to or, 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 you know, getting caught up in the throes of trying to implement on the industry side and in the, in the data protection authority side. So it was interesting to see how even the DPAs weren't ready and the DPAs, you know, they had, everyone had two years to get to the point of actually applying the regulation. The DPAs had the same time we did. I think they were just as panicked. And, um, and then, but then we started to see as from the summertime, some, some DPA enforcement. And that's starting to, to roll out because the, the regulation is super vague in a lot of places. It's, it's, it's led to a lot of interpretation, hasn't it? And that's a lot of interpretation. In France, for example, taking a hard line and others less so. Well, you're absolutely right. I think, that in, interestingly, I think arguably the French have not taken as hard a line as they could have on the worst bits of the GDPR. Very true. So like they're in, they're cutting concepts like freely given consent, you know, aspects of what constitutes freely given consent um, that are going to are gonna be um, re really complicated and potentially ugly discussions for us and that the, 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 the French have focused on um, in what constitutes informed consent, what constitutes specific consent stuff that's reasonable and that um, and that uh, in, in the first instance are things that we can we can fix and, and, and address. And um, so I think there is, there it has been, um, so now we're starting to see the in enforcement, we're starting to get a little bit more uh, more clarity and, um, and you know, um, help in the opportunity for both for companies to understand and for industry to, for, for us as a whole industry um, to try to shape and land the best, uh, best outcome, and best implementation of the, of the regulation. But how did this unpreparedness um, and readiness kind of affect IOB Europe? Because you have a, a fairly crucial role to play when it comes to helping the, the, all of your partners, all of your members understand GDPR, implement GDPR and try and be as compliant as possible in your kind of advisory role. How did this kind of lack of knowledge across everywhere else and, and across the people trying to enforce GDPR, how did that impact you? Um, I think that there, there's a combination of maybe, you know, there's, there's a, a lack of preparedness that came in part from just not understanding what, what, what a lot of the provisions meant. Yeah. So that the, the sort of insider line in Brussels is that the GDPR is a regulation written in the language of a directive. And a directive just like tells member states to go get to outcomes A, B, C and doesn't tell them how. Mm. And um, they just argued for four years over the GDPR, all the member states. And then they just gave up at the end and said, okay, we can't get any more prescriptive than this. Y you know, you figure it out, industry and DPAs. And um, so, so I think that our our role um, has been to get everyone around a table and and try to land um, both uh, um, understandings, and then maybe where we have an opportunity to proactively uh, champion um, uh, innovation and business friendly interpretations where there's scope for that, um, uh, but holding up one end of a dialogue with the DPAs. So we're we're um, we are in a continual dialogue with the DPAs and also with DG Just. Um, there's an interesting kind of institutional rivalry between the commission that has never wanted to completely let go of the GDPR because it's kind of this sexy and interesting and high profile dossier um, and pass it off completely to the DPAs and then the DPAs who, um, you know, feel now it's now it's theirs and then some competition between different DPAs um, to be first out of the blocks to um, to lay down markers and, and uh, especially on ad tech. Like it may right. feel like a headache for us, but we're like, I think we are kind of like this golden um, this attractive little shiny thing that a bunch of DPAs would like to um, have an important influence on.
and, mm. and make some uh, image making even for themselves. Really the interesting. Of, very interesting. Funny. And and uh, Stefan and, and Tom are kind of in your in your capacity, kind of in the sort of the legal side of things and looking at the data protection side of things in your roles. How do you think that your roles are going to change in year two? Do you think that they're going to get easier? Are they going to get more complicated? Is is <laughs> more, you know, more easy to communicate now? Stefan, what, what are your thoughts? Um, no, probably not. So what we're expecting next year or this year, end of this year or even next year's will be e-privacy, of course. So e-privacy regulation, yeah. um, which will, of course, be a game changer again. So some, some certain expectations, uh, but uh, well, there can still much flexibility in this dossier. Second topic, of course, um, enforcement. So, of course, um, now that some uh, some data protection authorities in certain countries have started enforcement, we expect the others to follow. Um, this will be interesting. Um, which topic they concentrate on? They are very active on 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 on, on uh, guidelines. Uh, so, a guideline about uh, under which circumstances data can be processed um, uh, for 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 um, the performance on a contract. Very strict, very narrow rules. Um, so, interesting discussions. So, many many different topics, and of course, um, the day to day work discussing all the different uh, contracts and so on with the different players. Um, <laughs> figuring out what suits uh, the different players best. So interesting work, but, but constant change. Interesting. And, and Tom, what's your take? Yeah, I, well, similar. Um, <laughs> I would just say that what, what probably is going to make my life easier uh, is the fact that, you know, privacy now is supposed like it's hopefully a priority for every single company. Um, so the privacy lawyer is, is not just the, the, the pain that you know every business has to, to work with. Like it, it's also now a business partner, part of a, you know creating the, the, the strategy, building the strategy within a company. Mm -hmm. So that in from that perspective, that's really going to help. But then, yeah, as Stefan said, uh, we have to monitor closely the, the situation, all the decisions from the different data protection authorities. Um, and um, there's a lot more to come. Um, you know, in, in, uh, on May 25th, 2018, it wasn't really a Y2K as, as some had predicted, but maybe there was going to be a decision. Is that, that yet to come? Well, we don't know, but right. it could happen. So, and something that's going to really shake up, you know, and, and when, if that happens, we definitely need some kind of framework to defend. You yeah, know. yeah. And Ed, you talked about the pinch earlier. Kind of, what are the big lessons for for you and for Spotex from year one that you're bringing into year two? Well, I think you know we've there's been some key lessons out of the TCF and the implementation of, of 1.0 and 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 how not everyone has adopted it for certain reasons, right? And I think it, the lesson there is that. The solution has to be as all-encompassing as it possibly can be, and I'm pleased that the update to 2.0 is going to cover a lot of these. But in the initial, you know, no no Google involvement, as I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss, uh, no no provision in the TCF 1.0 for legitimate interest. You know, I think that made it difficult for publishers to make the decision to adopt the framework, which is a framework that we fully are proponents of. Right? It's a it's an elegant solution to a very tricky um, issue and of course for those publishers that adopted legitimate interest TCF wasn't applicable for them um, so I think that that's that's a lesson we have to make this solution as all-encompassing as, as as possible and another uh, another idea I kind of had from a, a, a vendor perspective was just simply that we we must do our best to be as coordinated as possible in this next tech refresh right when we go from version one to two I think you know the launch of version one was tied to the the uh, effective date of, of, of GDPR um, but one of the major kind of challenges over the course of the last year have just been the differing speeds with which platforms have um, built out their support the different interpretations and I think uh, that that's a lesson clearly that's been learned, um, but, but but hopefully uh, we'll be able to adopt this in a in quite a cohesive and coordinated fashion. Yeah, I guess that is the that is the intention, and and Townsend that kind of brings us nicely onto you know let, let's take a step back for a second and let's kind of remind people that maybe aren't quite as au fait with kind of what the transparency consent framework is and why it was built, and kind of where we're going from obviously version one to the launch of version 2.0 and kind of what, the, the, okay. what that's addressing as kind of edge. 
point is legitimate interest, but there are obviously other things as well that it's, it's pointing towards. Absolutely. So I would imagine that um, people are might maybe a little bit more interested in version two, but 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 you're right. It's always worth backing up. Um, so the the purpose of the TCF, um, uh, which we actually started discussing like um, probably two and a half years ago, uh, was to make sure that for ad supported services, um, online services of, of all kinds, so you know publishers and and uh, and and other ad supported services, um, there was a um, there was a a scalable and um, efficient way to make sure that um, that first parties and third parties um, were all processing data um, with a GDPR legal basis. So it actually has like a reasonably narrow um, mission in life. It's just there to make sure that the third parties that have no direct connection to the user um, uh, are can can uh, um, obtain a legal basis that's mediated by the CMP by the by the, by the first party CMP working for the first party. Um, based on user choices, so it's transparency and control for users, and um, and then um, making sure there is a legal base for the data processing that goes on that depends on on user consent or user um, uh, user will user willingness, user lack of objection, as it were, and um, and that there's good communication about you know then up the chain in a standardized way so that vendors can communicate amongst themselves. This interoperability is is what makes the scale, and that's what. Um, what makes it um, what, what makes it attractive, and that's why it needs to be, if possible, you know, basically the only standard in the market. Um, so that's another whole dimension of the challenge is that you 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 don't want to get it partly in the market. It really has to be. Um, it really has to have very broad uptake. Um, so um, so maybe to move on to what what changes. Yeah. With so versions. obviously TCF was never supposed to be the kind of the, the be all and all the panacea to solve right. everything. It was always exactly. going to be an iterative process. So what exactly. have the lessons been learned, and kind of what. How does 2.0 address those? So, um, so as was was previously pointed out, um, TCF out of the blocks was basically just a consent solution. It had a kind of indirect support for legitimate interests. There are basically two legal bases that are um, are relevant in the GDPR for um, data processing in connection with advertising, consent, and legitimate interests. And so we started with a consent tool, but we got the message really early on um, last year, actually when version 1.0 went out for public comment, that consent alone wasn't going to be enough, yeah. and that a lot of publishers wanted the possibility to use legitimate interest, a lot of vendors wanted the possibility to use legitimate interest. So we've actually had like a like a like a 15 month conversation about how to um, how, how to how to render that accommodation um, for legitimate interests. Um, and um, so that there there's sort of like a, uh, three three or four big changes. So there's the accommodation of a, of a new legal basis. There's the possibility um, for vendors to have what we're calling flexible legal bases. So, um, so in the current version of the framework, a vendor has to choose between, um, well, well, consent or, or legitimate interest and, um, or sign up uh, expressing a willingness to work on the basis of consent or legitimate interest. In future, in version 2.0, um, uh, vendors will be able to sign up for both possibilities, indicate a willingness to work on the basis of both legal bases, and then let the publisher um, decide which of those legal bases is most appropriate for the publisher. Um, in lots of ways, version 2.0, as I, I sort of previously implied, it's kind of the publisher version. Yeah. Um, so, um, so in addition to this um, additional legal basis, a more, more complete accommodation of, of legitimate interest, there are really important um, publisher controls built in. So um, the publisher will have the possibility to, um, to have much more granular control over what the vendors can do. Um, so um, uh, subsets of vendors will be able to um, subsets of technology partners will be able to process data for certain purposes and other subsets and other subset of your technology partners, um, uh, you, the publisher could authorize to process data for um, a different set of purposes. That won't be visible to the user because we sort of had to make trade-offs between capacity of the, of the signal and um, benefits to users. The publishers really want the control, really want to be able to know, um, uh, you know which vendors are operating and doing what. Um, the user will only have a choice between which vendors um, he's happy to have process the data and um, for which data processing purposes. Um, so another um, another change is that there are new, there are more granular purposes uh, which also advance the objective of increasing publisher control. So we had five purposes. We have five purposes in version 1.0. We have will have um, 12 purposes. 
in, uh, in, in version 2.0. And in some cases, there are um, those, this 12 purposes are we just broken down um, uh, what were arguably kind of compound purposes or arguably compound purposes in version 1.0. Um, but, but in some cases, there are, there are um, a, a couple of completely new um, uh, purposes. There's different, different treatment of some um, kind of sensitive categories of data. But, but the point, again, being that the publisher has both more insight and visibility and, and uh, it's a granular visibility into what vendors can do and more control over um, over what they can do. And the user also, of course, benefits from that added, you know, from having um, uh, more um, more specific purposes. And so um, there's arguably kind of more, tr more transparency and control for users. That was in part um, a, a uh, uh, that's a, a feedback that we got a little bit from the data protection authorities because we, we took the TCF right. on the road um, in the first half of last year with about, I guess you guys probably um, saw like 10 VPAs. We had a team that, that went around and saw between eight and 10 VPAs. And um, it's, you know, get, getting back to the interpretation issue, like on the one hand, um, the DPAs want specificity and they don't want any, they don't want, um, they want users to understand exactly what's going to be What's, what's going to happen. Um, but then it can't get too technical or legalistic because then users arguably don't understand what they're consenting to and that you know that you, you undermine the, 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 the principle of informed consent. So so the, the our, our purposes are, are more granular, which benefits arguably both users and um, and publishers and even gives the, the vendors more um, more more clarity. Um, I just want to say quickly with respect to Google that we are absolutely. I want to ask. Um, yeah. Absolutely, um, Google have been like. I mean, to be fair, they've been deeply implicated in the work. They have put yeah. some really high end resources into this work over the last eight months, and um, so we have um, both on the tech side and on the policy development side, and they have been you know really consistent since last early last autumn, saying they are absolutely going to implement as soon as version 2.0 is really dried and you know, done and dusted, and it's clear what the go do is for their engineers. And um, is, you know, there, so, is there a potential time frame on that? Kind of when are we looking at Google actually being yeah, listed so, within it? So I think the timing, the timing is, is, is uh, you know, it's still a little bit speculative. So we have a comment period of 30 days that yeah. ends on the, in a couple of weeks now, 25th of May. If we got like not much feedback from the market, we could probably, you know, in a couple of weeks, tie off um, the implementation version of the technical specs and the policies, and you know, hit the market. Um, and um, if there's, you know, if there is feedback, um, we hope not, because we have, you know, a, a complicated discussion for a really long time now. So, so, but, but in the event that there were some feedback that actually required, you know, a significant amendment and some discussion. So you can imagine that might take closer to six weeks or eight weeks. I don't know. So that would put us, let's say that puts us end of June, say first of July, hopefully at the max, um, we would have an implementation version of the, um, of the, you know, implementation version of the specs and the policies. Um, then it's just a question of how long it takes to build. And um, right. So, you know, some companies say, well, it's going to be, it's going to be three months. Um, it probably depends on the size of the company. Um, that's my and uh, and the other colleagues could speak much better to what the challenges are depending on, on uh, a lot of the market um, as, as somebody pointed out also maybe Ed um, uh, hasn't even implemented version 1.0 actually it's like virgin territory yeah. in, uh, in you know a lot of German publishers a lot of Scandinavian publishers have not even so there, there won't be a transition they'll just be they'll just be implementation of them so, so it's hard to it, it's hard to it, it's hard to say but um, but certainly as from um, I would say you know as from the end of the summer um, Hopefully there should be implementation, and and we have a, a dedicated technical group now looking at um, how exactly to manage the, the 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 transition from a technical point of view. So we're going to have 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 some period during which both versions are operative. That we're going to be under some pressure from the DPAs, I think, to get version 2.0 up and running, you know, as fast as we can. Um, it was going to require all new consents um, okay. because there's no back. Compatibility, right? Um, so you know that's that's uh, that's that's something you don't want to hit everybody with, um, you know, the entire um, European population with consent uh, renewal requests on the same day. So um, I think those are the those are maybe the key things to call okay. out. And, and you you refer to it as the the um, the, kind of the framework for publishers. So, so Stefan, it'd be interesting to hear from you, kind of as as the, the, the publisher in the room, um, kind of what that means for for you and what it also means for your users, kind of how how version two point will will be different for you and how it's implemented and how you're able to adopt it 
So I think um, for, from a from a user's perspective, so front side, so I think the differences won't be that uh, that strong. So if, if it all depends on um, on the user interface, how this is designed. Of course, our goal will be to design it as comfortable for the user as possible. So I think the work is more done in the background. So what is important is this uh, aspect of ultimate control for publishers and this granular, uh, the granular choice in terms of, 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 of purposes. However, these purposes are linked together to stacks. So I wouldn't call them bundling, but um, it's a bundle of purposes. But it's in the end, it's putting different purposes in organics and, 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 and systematic way together so that the user can understand Understand um, what he or she is consenting to, so the user will be confronted with stacks in in, in, in harmonized and um, standardized uh, language. So um, yeah, this will be new, um, but the user experience shouldn't and deviate is, is significantly from what the user is used by now to, uh, when it comes to, to, to cookie banners and uh, cookie notices on websites and uh, to, to, to other cookie requ uh, consent requests uh, in the online world. So in short, not much changes, more flexibility, more choice for, for the user, for those users who are willing to, to exercise this right to choose. Um, so clear advantage um, in the end it all uh, depends on on on, on the design and uh, the usability of, of of the content management platform okay great um, and we're running out of time but i do want to kind of obviously hear from from ed and, and tom as well as to kind of how 2.0 what what 2.0 will mean mean for for you guys and your businesses so so ed kind of from Spotify's perspective yeah you know, i mean what um, will your stakeholder I, I, I think that um, certainly from from the publisher perspective, right, they needed more more control over vendor activity. This gives them that. Um, I think because this uh, next specification is more inclusive, we're approaching a kind of ubiquitous system that will re reduce friction on the buy side. As a as a vendor, um, I, I think that you know probably the most significant takeaway at this stage is uh, you know the resource that will be in investing, I suppose, into the into the update of the of the TCF 2.0. The fact that there is no backwards cap co compatibility means that you know, we will be supporting both um, at the same time. So I think we're going to have to uh, think think hard about how we how we how we manage that transition. Um, and, and you know, since the five purposes don't perfectly map, I suppose, to the the twelve purposes that we have, we we may have to do some 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 evaluation, some reevaluation on how our platform um, reacts to uh, rather how the, how the different functionalities in our platform map back to those purposes. Um, but overall, it's, it's, it's a seriously um, positive update. So it's, it's, it's an absolutely necessary requirement, but it will require some, some resource, some work, there'll be some teething problems, but it's to be expected with a new framework, we will, I guess, get there. And, and, and Tom, kind of from your perspective, from AppNexus, comma, Azanda, company kind of how um 2.0 will be implemented by you guys yeah i mean that's going to be the same the same kind of uh you know experience uh we're gonna have to allocate resource um internally to build to the specs and and to be able to read the signals uh but also i think it's uh you know training the, the teams on the ground um so that they have they're equipped to actually help our customers, so both the publishers, but also like the buy side clients, and um, and it's that's that's really where we're gonna have to. to I'm gonna have to spend a bit of time, you know, explaining what the version two brings to the table. Um, but then the teams are hopefully gonna be able to do it themselves and and just go out and and and, and you know evangelize uh, the framework. Um, so that it's implemented by you know the entire industry but yeah. because their standard doesn't is really useless if you know there's only a couple of yeah completely and I guess implemented correctly as well because there have been a couple of issues this year where there's been people implementing the framework incorrectly and then kind of them get, getting there, there, there was an example of a fine in France when they're actually implementing the framework incorrectly um, so there's 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 still obviously a lot of work to do and that will potentially come up again it will this be easier to implement or will it require the same level of resource and the same level of understanding and, and education and evangelizing almost on the, on the framework. You're very good to point out that it was poor implementation. It is not your fault. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like you know, hard for me to speak for the company. Yeah. In terms of the 
complexity. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see what comes back from the market on the on the complexity of it. There is a small uh, accommodation for out of band signals. Right. Um, we have managed to pack everything into the consent string for a while. Last year, we spent a lot of time last year thinking we would deliver the functionality with a combination of a text file that could be optional or mandatory. We didn't really land it. And uh, and we've come out with being able to jam everything into the uh, string, you know, with, without um, introducing excess, you know, problems of latency and everything else. So, um, but it'll be interesting to see, uh, it'll be fascinating to see what comes back uh, in terms of comments about the increased complexity. I mean, I think, you know, all the, the complexity that we've built in, the basic complexity we built in is just what was asked for. Yeah. The stacks issue may be more than people, you know, um, can, can you know, uh, intellectually and emotionally face. Um, but I think that will kind of shake down also over, you know, the first uh, year, 18 months. There'll be a few stacks that people use and then, you know, um, a lot that just falls away by um, atrophy. Okay, okay. So it, will, it will take a bit of try, trying and testing before everyone gets to a kind of a, a level where they are happy with, with the stacks they've got implemented. And as you say, it could be atrophy, but actually it's uh, it, it's all down to each individual person's implementing it, right? And how, they, how they're how using it and what they're seeing as to how it actually will then play out going forwards. And there's still time to play with and there's still, it's, it's still not launched yet. So um, on that note, we're gonna have to end it, but it's been a fascinating chat to you all. I wanna say thank you very much to Townsend, Ed, Stefan and Toma. And uh, yeah, I think uh, Simon is lurking. Simon's now here. Hello. Hi. Have we finished? We have finished. Excellent. So I missed the last five minutes as I wait outside the room. It's not that we're not listening to the bits that are going on as well. So first of all, thank you, everyone. Really super interesting. And I think there's a massive appetite for everyone to see how this develops over the next few weeks, right? We're getting a consultation and the steps forward. Yeah. But massive progress. I know at Verizon, we're, we're big supporters as well of um, the TCS. I want to help driving that forward as a dialogue. So we have a few little... Uh, Announcements and thank yous to, to go through just before we end the, the call today. Uh, first of all, a reminder of the pro programmatic audio survey that closes this week. We spoke about that a little bit earlier on. <clears throat> um, we're pleased to announce the next one of these already, which will be on November 19th. And registrations are opening pretty much straight away. There'll be a link after this event as well. Topic to that event are going to include programmatic out of home, attribution. We think it's time to come back to attribution as a discussion. Um, and also the results of the Attitudes to Programmatic Survey, which Fieldwork will be in market pretty soon. Um, so look at that as an opportunity to just help give context on where we are in the market. Excuse me, everybody. <coughs> um, also coming up is Interact. So uh, if you're interested, please buy tickets and attend. It's an incredible event in Warsaw this year on the 4th and 5th of June. Um, a tremendous range of speakers, really deep, rich, two-day agenda. Um, Anita from Verizon's there, and she's wonderful. So. Um, just go and see her alone. Uh, but there's still an opportunity to buy tickets and there's also awards uh, at the same time. So uh, really go and move. On behalf of the Programmatic Training Committee who organized uh, this event with IBU, I would like to thank all of today's speakers. I would like to thank uh, the team IAB who helped put us all together and the marketing teams that have helped them also distribute the uh, awareness of the event. The recording of this event is going to be available, so it'll be on the website, IAB Europe website, hopefully early next week in, the, in about a week or so. Um, and please do leave feedback uh, on the survey at the end of the event. We always want to keep trying to make certain these are hitting the audience and adding value for everybody. And with that, I think it's just thank you very much for everyone. And please contact Marie Claire and visit all the wonderful IAB Europe resources as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you.